Hi, welcome back to Interfex Live. We're here to talk today with uh, Paris Gallagher and Jerry Martin. We're going to be talking about the approval of biosimilars. So let me ask you a really dumb question right up front. Biosimilars or biogenerics, what's the deal? Um, well, the term biogenerics is not widely used, and I, I think the main reason is that uh, uh, biological drugs are far more complex than traditional uh, generic small molecules, and so uh, a lot of people didn't feel comfortable using the word generic because it, it implied a, a simplicity that doesn't exist with biological. So we use the term biosimilar instead. Uh, it's much more difficult to confirm that the alternate source is identical to the Absolutely. original one. So the, hence the similar. Parish, you want to right. You can prove you can prove that a generic small molecule generic is identical chemically uh, and as Jerry points out uh, that's quite right you can't do that with biologics uh, the analytical methods are not precise enough to demonstrate precise structure uh, therefore you cannot claim identity hence biosimilar okay great the reason for that now we got into an endless discussion on this one at another meeting at one point and that was the point that actually we cannot analytically determine similarities but that's a point that i think people sometimes miss well, okay I think, I think the point Russ, is they can't you can't claim identity, identity. identical yeah. nature yeah. you can claim similarity because yeah. within the variability of the analytical methods so that's why it's similar and you can't claim identity i got you yeah and the outcome, I mean, and the other thing I think with generics is we do a blood level, we do plasma levels, and we say, well, gee whiz, they're the same. Again, right. don't apply in this case, yeah. correct? So, so there's a lot more requirements for uh, clinical data with the biosimilar uh, so that you're looking for comparable clinical response and safety profiles. Uh, whereas with a small molecule generic, the, the identity is close enough that have far less of a requirement for um, developing a, a unique set of clinical data to support the claims. So it sounds like a lot, lot more expensive proposition. A lot more expensive proposition. Okay. Right. So, what are the perspectives of suppliers that manufacturers of biosimilars, Jerry? What, what the... Well, from from the supplier perspective, there really isn't a lot of difference between um, an originator drug and uh, and a and a biosimilar, uh, the, the incentive for biosimilars is in um, reducing the cost uh, to the sponsor uh, from the, the original clinical trials of identifying a new molecular entity. Uh, but in terms of manufacturing, uh, it's, it's quite similar. Um, I think the, the one thing that we've been uh, somewhat surprised about is that we originally thought that biosimilar manufacturer would open up the possibility of innovative manufacturing processes that would even further reduce the cost of biological manufacturing. But for the most part, biosimilar manufacturers have been looking to mimic the existing platforms because um, I think they, they feel it's going to be easier to pass regulatory approval. Right, agreed. The, the, the fewer changes that you make from the reference product manufacturing process, uh, the less risk you have yeah. in, in creating a, a dissimilar product. Yeah. Um, so now we may start out that way or the industry may start out that way, but over time as biosimilars mature and come to market, there'll be post-approval changes which you know, are occurring today, have been occurring on innervative molecules for years, those post-approval changes for biosimilars will continue to advance the manufacturing technology, reduce costs, increase efficiency over, yeah. over the years to come. But as a starter, folks want to be conservative, as Jerry is pointing out, uh, in order to ensure and reduce the risk uh, of, getting, of getting approval. So I know there was some uh, discussions about continuous uh, bioprocessing. Yeah, it was the actually quite a session. few, yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, I, I, th I think that that's still quite a few years away. Um, and there's going to be some significant cost savings that come out of continuous manufacturing. And I think one of the drivers to that will ultimately be as biosimilars come in and there is some cost reduction 
uh, that's going to ultimately drive uh, perhaps not the biosimilar manufacturers, but some of the uh, originators to um, upgrade their processes with a continuous so that they can be more cost competitive with some of the biosimilars. Well, I tell you, one of the things I've learned from the bio group, and being an old small molecule guy myself, one of the things that I'm, I've learned was if it isn't broke, you don't touch it, and you don't scale it up unless you absolutely have to. I learned that when I, I believe I walked through a facility at one time, and uh, I was amazed at why they were using, they, would, they had rocking bottles, rooms of them. And it was explained to me that they don't change things because that only creates a problem. So having said that, I mean, I, it's hard for me to believe continuous process is ever really going to be there. I mean, uh, well, you know, when, when you had exclusive on, uh, on the product and uh, the challenge was just to get the, the product out, I, I think the classic example of that was probably the original Epigen from Amgen, which mm -hmm. was made in racks and racks of roller bottles. Uh, when they were the only game in town, they scaled it up and, and got out there. But, but now that biosimilars of EPO are coming in, uh, that's not going to be a very cost-effective way. And uh, uh, follow-on companies uh, move to stir tank bioreactors uh, to make EPO. Right. Um, and I think in, in the same way, as uh, the biosimilars come in and the costs come down, um, the next generations beyond that will look at um, continuous manufacturing mm. as a way of, of both improving quality as, as FDA is looking for, mm -hmm. but also uh, bring the cost down. So, Parrish, let me ask you this question then. So, if you're going to work on a process, and we have already ascertained that exact identification is not going to be, you know, can't say something is exact. How does one then tweak its pro your process and say it's still the same process? Just help me out on that one. Well, it comes down to the safety, purity, and potency of the product that's produced by the process. So fortunately, the guidelines don't say you have to use the, even the same cell line. They don't say you have to use the same process. What they're saying is analyze the product that you're producing and demonstrate as similar safety, purity, and potency. Gotcha. And that includes the impurities. So, so because the impurities can be just as important with regard to immunogenicity in the body as the drug itself. So, so as a result, you have a, you, somewhat of an open country, you know, open territory on the process, but the more changes that you make, the higher risk you're going to run that you are going to create a, a, a different outcome, a, a different, a non-similar, biosimilar product. So that's why people are, are, are remaining more conservative right. and trying to use the same type of cell line, the same type of purification process, same type of bioreaction process. And that's why I think, you know, back to Jerry's discussion about continuous processing, continuous processing may be more efficient. And I, I use the word maybe. Um, there's a lot of debate about continuous processing. It's certainly powerful with regard to maintaining product consistent product quality once you can establish steady state in a continuous process right, right. but establishing continuous steady state in a biological process is more complex yeah. mm -hmm. than a small molecule process for instance uh, and and so it is not as you know simple to achieve uh, as as it might sound so I think the debate is out we'll see over the next five ten years how continuous processing really fares in this space uh, and whether or not it's going to lead to yeah. lower costs. Well, and in the meantime, we're seeing biosimilars simply looking to copy the originator process uh, as a way of minimizing the variables. So on that out. note, so we've established that the molecule, the bio, is, is my, by a molecular, mo the molecule is the same or close, right? Close. How about on the fill finish or as I prefer, you know, the final formulation, do you, are you still, Based with that same quandary, I mean, you know. Well, well that's the level at which you're demonstrating yeah. safety, purity, and potency. It's got to be right. the final dosage form. Right. Right. And and if you're using the same dosage form that that the reference molecule uses, let's say IV, uh, you're going to demonstrate safety, purity, and potency of the finished drug product uh, with regard to, right. in reference in, in relation to the reference product. Uh, and once you do that biochemically, then of course, then you need to demonstrate it in animals in bioassays, and, in, and then in animals, and then eventually, as Jerry said earlier, through clinical, clinical studies. Yeah. So you, you're not obligated to formulate 
the biosimilar in exactly the same uh, uh, solution conditions or stabilizing agents, uh, but you have to show that the active is uh, comparable and that its its mode of action and its safety pro well its mode of actions are comparable and its safety profiles are acceptable. And it's a good question because different formulations are seen by biosimilar developers as a way to capture more market share over the reference product, right? So improve methods of dosing, of dosing, improve stability or storage or ease of use uh, that are also maybe uh, more reimbursable by payers mm -hmm. uh, are all you know marketing ploys to potentially yeah. grab more of the market share. Yeah. So folks do want to you know move in the direction of improved formulations, and of course as you as you know that invokes more risk, more time to get those new formulations through the approval process. So at GE Healthcare, that's a, you're fully integrated from formulation back to fermentation and synthesis then. You well, our focus, our focus is making the API. API, okay. API. And we do, we do enable fill finish operations with our single use components. Okay. Um, and, and that's a growing space for us. But our focus really is to enable I companies know. to make their biosimilar API. Okay. Is that yeah. same with you, Jerry, then? Yeah. And, I mean, the, the fill finish is a, 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 a very critical, uh, highly regulated area. Uh, it tends to be dominated by specialty companies. Uh, that we support with uh, sterilizing filtration and uh, single-use filling systems, even uh, single-use disposable needles, but we're supplying the tools mm -hmm. to the companies that are doing the, the final filling itself. Yeah. Just so you know, we had this big discussion on sterilization options open. Uh, Betty Howard from Steris was here, and know, she, Betty, yeah. we gave us the whole thing. We got into this whole debate, so yeah. you know, about this. So I just wanted to you know, it, it seems like that's a, even another science. I mean, you got to know pretty much what you want to do ahead of time. You got to build it yeah. in up front. But and the other reason I ask, it seems like the fill finish or the dosage form development seems sometimes to not get the attention. But I would seem to me that that plays just as critical a role there. It's yeah. absolutely yeah. as critical, absolutely. no question yeah. about it. Yeah. And in a lot of territories where biosimilars are, are, are being developed and, and for emerging territories, Fill finish is really uh, a, a huge gap in, in the service offering. The infrastructure to do fill finish really is missing in a lot of new you know, emerging territories. So there's even more pressure on the ability to you know, provide fill finish capability yeah. along with API production capability. Right. right. So once the biosimilar API is, is developed, then there's a, a whole other step to right. do that final formulation, and that's the clinical batches that first need to go through clinical trials right. to ultimately seek approval. Right. And on the, on the discussion on modularity, just so you understand, that they, they were talking about this aspect as Phil finishes. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry about it. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm starting to fall asleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, um, the Phil finish part, and they were talking about, you know, the ability to move Phil finish capacity out to even you know, third world countries or, you know, areas that need to be developed. And the whole discussion surrounded that aspect of it. Just so, you know, I think yeah. there's a lot of people yeah. on the modular front. There's the modular synthetic front and there's the modular fill finish front. So I see there's two, yeah. two, two schools working yeah. on this. Well, you know, I think the, 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 um, the, the actual practice of fill finish is um, the formulation itself aside is not that different between small molecules and, and I, biologicals. I agree, yeah. yeah. I so agree. once you get to that point, um, the, the, the process itself is the same. Uh, so it's really the formulation that, that becomes critical in terms of the stability of the, of the biosimilar and, and how it ultimately performs in the clinical trials. Okay, and on that note with the module, like you know, flying us off into the hinterland and all that, so what differences in the major regions of the world on this uh, whole biosimilar, I mean, obviously, Europe is different than the United States. So can you break that down for us, uh, Parrish? So what do you think? Okay, sure. So as as you know, Europe, uh, the European community is much more advanced with regard to approval of, of biosimilars. Uh, there are uh, many of them that are approved, uh, including uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, which the first of which was approved a year or two ago. So, so the regulatory pathway in Europe is, is maturing, matured far beyond 
uh, most every other territory in the world. Um, the U.S. just started, as you know, Sandoz's product was, was recently uh, licensed by uh, the FDA, uh, the Phil Graston product for the U.S. market. Uh, so, so the FDA is coming along, and uh, hopefully the next, uh, the next approval will be, will be for a monoclonal antibody biosimilar in the U.S. Um, with regard to, uh, to the, the um, question about um, the guidelines around biosimilar approvals, in Europe, the, 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 it's handled, a lot, of, a lot of the issues are handled at the national level. Uh, and in the U.S. As, as well, there is a lot of influence from the state, uh, from the different states with regard to biosimilar quality and also this issue of interchangeability. That is, is the biosimilar so similar to the reference product that, that the physician or the pharmacist can literally interchange them uh, and, 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 and there really are, are no other issues to deal with. So there's biosimilarity and there's interchangeability uh, that the issues that are moving through these regulatory you know, frameworks yeah. and approval processes that'll be very interesting as, as, they, as, the, yeah. as the years go, go, go forward here. So well, we, we, I think we need to think about approval of, of biosimilars in, uh, in perhaps a different way than we normally think of drug approval. So I'd also like to add that uh, in terms of where in the world biosimilars are being used, um, in Asia, biosimilars are very widespread today. There are many biosimilars, uh, particularly in India, that are on the market and are, and are commonly used. Um, the, the, the interest in biosimilars for Europe and the United States is because it's anticipated they can get a much higher price uh, than they can in India, and so that's, that's where the profits are. Uh, but here in the US, uh, the success of biosimilars will ultimately come from whether it provides sufficient cost savings. Uh, I've heard something like 50% of the drugs um, that we use in the United States are purchased by state and federal government uh, agencies, and they are the ones that are the keenest in, um, in buying biosimilars at a lower cost. If, if you're personally um, paying for the drug uh, and you're with your doctor, uh, they may be more reluctant to switch to a biosimilar if it costs 20% less because they're just unfamiliar with it. But um, the Medicaid or Medicare or state uh, or big insurance companies, uh, they're, they're the ones who are going to achieve the, right. the savings. Um, and if the individual states get involved in approving whether a biosimilar is accepted as interchangeable, um, it's going to be some time before we, you know, really see that benefit broadly. So let me see if I got this straight. So if I was to write for a generic, I use the generic name, the chemical name, right? And by law, I'm, the reason I, I'm a pharmacist by trade, although right. I've been, you know, polishing stainless steel for many more <laughs> years than I care to think about. But the answer really comes, my, what the, the answer I'm looking for is, the way the prescriptions are written, let's talk about in this state or in Jersey, they're pretty right. much the same. If it's a generic name, they substitute. That's it. What I'm, so I hear you right. So they can't do that with a biosimilar. No, there, there's a distinction between it's biosimilar and it's interchangeable. And so it's a really interesting distinction uh, because clearly the biosimilar developer wants to achieve interchangeability, right? So that the pharmacist can literally yeah. swap out depending on what the physician is doing and, and, and what the patient wants. The issue with interchangeability, one of the big issues with interchangeability is traceability. So for instance, if, if a patient is getting you know, one drug or the other, the reference or the biosimilar in an interchangeable fashion, regulatory bodies are worried about if there's an adverse event down line with the patient, how are they gonna know, how are they gonna trace back which drug it was? If, if the two were being used interchangeably in the treatment regimen of that patient, then how are they gonna trace back as to which molecule, the, the reference product for the biosimilar was in fact a root cause? So that's, that's one of the issues around interchangeability among, among others. But back to, back to the rest of the world, you asked earlier about yeah. you know, the rest of the world. As Jerry's pointing out, we see a huge interest in biosimilars around the world. Um, 
the question is whether or not those those communities are going to be able to afford those biosimilars because they obviously are more complex they're more expensive to make so it'll be very interesting but there are many many companies that both of our companies are servicing around the world to build biosimilar facilities their governments are promoting the development of biosimilars and manufacturing those biosimilars in those countries for those countries uh, and 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 actually enabling uh, the development and the commercialization of those biosimilars in many of those countries. So there's a huge amount of activity outside the U.S. and Europe around the rest of the world. So what's the driver? I mean, obviously... Quality of life. Uh, avail yeah. Availability of the drug? Yeah. Is the I mean, is some of these drugs are value. really yeah. potent drugs. I mean, yeah. these biotech drugs, really biosimilar, these you know, biologics are very yeah. successful yeah. in many yeah. indications. And there are many people around the world with the same diseases we have here, of course, in the U.S. and Europe. And, and those yeah. people want, want those and drugs. These, these branded um, originator biologicals are, are life-saving drugs, uh, which are not available to the vast majority of the population on the planet. And so there's a huge demand for access to these types of biologicals. And uh, the only way that's gonna happen is uh, if the cost comes down. And the and, economic yeah. upside, I mean, $67 billion worth of current revenue is subject now to coming off patents. So there's a big nugget there, a gold nugget for biosimilar companies to pursue. It's closer, that's, that's the global number. It's obviously smaller in the, in, the, in the individual territories, but there's a lot of money on the table there potentially for, for new biosimilar companies to, yeah. to pursue. You know, it's, I have to say that people move between generic drugs. I just, so you, so, you know, and I, I got to tell you, if it's a CNS drug, it doesn't always work the same. Yeah. There's reams of data written about a lot of CNS drugs that they're, they may be chemically the same, but they don't act the same. So, you know well, what the, I mean? I, mean the, I think the formulation it can have a big uh, absolute, factor in that. I think the formulation, uh, the physical chemistry, right. I mean, the fact that uh, they may, but what I'm trying yeah. to say is I think sometimes, I think, you know, maybe... I think it's because you can't come up with a definitive answer is the reason you're being held at a yeah. higher and, level. And FDA, I think FDA has been very conservative about this, yeah. and, and rightfully so, because while, while the uh, Congress is very eager to encourage biosimilars, uh, similar to generics, because they want to bring the cost of health care down, uh, the onus is on the FDA to ensure that, that these drugs are safe and effective. And, uh, and they're being you know, rightfully conservative of, about ensuring that. And even, even after we see more biosimilars approved, uh, there will still be several years where that's going to be watched very closely because when you do a clinical trial, uh, it's still only on a small population. Uh, maybe you're testing a few hundred patients and then the drug gets approved. So if you have an adverse effect that only shows up in one in a thousand patients, uh, you're not going to see that in a clinical trial. You're only going to see that in phase four in pharmacovigilance. And, and so, uh, you know, the jury is going to be out for some time. I agree, the but of these. I agree. But the small molecules, you know, they may put 2000 people in their phase three studies, but let's face it, once you launch it, your statistics go and get, yeah. you're going to see stuff you've not seen. Right. What I'm trying to say, right, let's not get into that. I just, I, I feel an injustice here, or over, not injustice, let's call it over conservative, overly conservative. Okay, having said that, $67 billion, Parrish, that's got to be a big nut for the bio industry. I mean, what's, what's that going to, that's got to be well, like Of course, that's time. the global revenue number yeah. for the, the, you know, the next five years worth of bio, the innovator molecules or reference molecules that are coming off patent. So that's, that's the amount of revenue at risk that the reference companies are, are have today that could be scooped by yeah. biosimilar companies. Of course, right. it's the not to say they're going to lose that. They're it's not going to lose it all. That's, but that's, 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 that's the target number, for okay? the biosimilar so, companies. Oh, yeah. That, so, that, that but would you, be if they scoop all of it. But of yeah. course, they won't because, as we know, the reference companies, uh, product companies, are going to respond uh, on price, price reductions because they can, yeah. because their margins are rich. They're also, as Jerry's pointing out, making their manufacturing and cost infrastructures more efficient so their costs are lower so that they can be, they can lower their prices. Uh, and so it'll be very interesting outcome to see how, you know, who's going to 
get what portion of the, that 60 or 70 billion dollars worth of, of essential some of these innovator molecules their their factories are fully amortized they there's a lot of margin that they can give up to yeah. stay competitive so I got gotcha. you it's not going to switch right away it's going to be a, far yeah. from it no no by any stretch but I yeah. I would guess that you know based on what I've seen with you know on our end of the, on our side of the business you know you're going to lose almost the day it happens 30 percent yeah I don't think I don't think the biologicals will be that quick. Yeah. That, that's the high end. That's yeah. what people are saying is going to be the high end. I mean, who knows? Yeah. But, but because there is such a, a complex, uh, uh, there, it's such a complex process to bring about a similar market, there has to be an R, you know, a return on investment that, that people are going to be able to tolerate, and that's going to drive the price up and reduce the amount of price reduction that you're going to okay. see in the biosimilar space. So how do you pick your targets? I mean, uh, what's, you know, in other words, what, what are some of the, what's the trend? In other words, monoclonal, I mean, <clears throat> how do you pick it? Is it? Or do they just come, you know, I mean, you, obviously you got to go after something that's going to reap a benefit, not only for the health, but also, let's face it, we're in it to make money, too. I think we've seen the biosimilar companies have targeted the most widely accepted drugs with the, with the largest market potentials, um, and, and that's, that, that's what they're going to go after. Right. Is, is all, all these mega monoclonals. Is, is, yeah. I mean, the FDA revealed that they have met, they had met 62 companies as of a couple of years ago, pursuing the same six or seven molecules. So there, there'll be a big shakeout in. Well. In bio so yeah, I have to revise my other question. And 67 billion looks like it's a crowded territory yeah, as well. It is mm -hmm. extremely crowded. So. And again, as Jerry said earlier, the, the competitive landscape is really going to get interesting over the next five, ten years. Well, on that note, one of the things that was discussed earlier today was that one of the things that was always a concern was that the capacity to make biologics was a fixed asset in this country, incapable of really expanding any great, any great amount. That was probably some ideas that were kicked around a few years ago. Obviously, since you guys are strongly jumping after, running after this, so how does that really... How does that, is that, you know what I mean? Obviously our ability to make biologics has greatly increased. Yeah, so, uh, we, you know, when you say that the capacity for biologics is, is fixed, I, I, the first thing I would want to do is split that between large scale monoclonals okay. and everything else. Gotcha. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the large scale monoclonals require large fixed uh, factories and yeah there's a finite number of those in this country okay. high dose uh, right. that's very high dose drugs um, but for the uh, for the biological the newer biologicals that are more active uh, can be given in smaller doses uh, the, the uh, uh, capacity the size of those uh, facilities is a lot smaller that's being addressed with a lot of the single use uh, facilities so capacity is no longer a limitation for the small ones uh, it, it, it could be for the big ones, uh, but, but the developers uh, have increased the productivity of the cells. Uh, so, you know, we're, even in, in the large scale, we're not seeing a capacity limitation. I think okay. there's still an excess of capacity. Right, so there are many, you know, on the order of 2,000 liter, multiple 2,000 liter biosimilar facilities being built today around the world mm -hmm. in, in smaller territories serving smaller markets. Uh, so they don't require these huge mega plants. At the same time, our legacy mega plants are being uh, commissioned now to make, you know, to make biosimilars for, for, for larger markets. So Celtrion is a good, a good example of Remicade. Yeah. You know, they have a very large facility in Korea, and they're making Remicade for a very large part of the, the global market mm -hmm. yeah. uh, using that large facility. So a lot of these larger facilities may get recommissioned or just continue to be used. Uh, and certainly will be continue to be used if they're if they've been kept up uh, to produce and 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 even even with lower prices to produce in this new market. Yeah. So there's a lot of capacity going online in Korea, not just Celtrion, but Samsung, LG yeah. uh, are all putting in large scale monoclonal antibody. They're going to be doing the the mega uh, monoclonals. So. How does all this work on the cost pressure in a biosimilar market? Then I mean, this has got to be tough on you guys. Oh, it doesn't really impact us as suppliers very much. I mean, we're, we're, while the drugs will sell at a lower price, 
the, the, the cost of the equipment that goes into making those drugs is, is not at a lower price. The, uh, the, the volume is much greater, so there's an expansion in, in the supply side of it. Yeah. Um, and as more people get access to these drugs given the, the lower cost. Right, so it, you know, it's a great opportunity for, for advanced technology suppliers like, like Paul, like GE, and others uh, to enable all these companies. I mean, there are hundreds of biosimilar companies spread around the globe that are, are developing them, have developed them for local territories, and who want to expand their facilities to, to take on larger territories. So for the suppliers in this, in this space and of advanced manufacturing technologies, it's really a very busy time. And growth mm -hmm. rates, growth rates, sales are, are just tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is how long will it continue before the competition hits to the point where there is a, there is a shaking out uh, you know, of the industry? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But this is very similar to what we saw with, with small molecule generics, is that uh, the, the originator uh, may get hit because competition is coming in at a lower price. But uh, the expansion in, in the volume of drug that gets made is significant. Uh, far more patients come to benefit from this, and so that the total uh, production goes up. And as equipment suppliers, that means our market is expanding with the introduction of generics and with the introduction of biosimilars. Right, let me just get back to that capacity thing again. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me that, you know, considering that the fill, finish, or formulation aspect is outsourced, I mean, essentially, you supply, is there going to be a bottleneck there? It seems that, is that, it seems to me that's got to be finite as well, or not? I really think it is a bottleneck. Yeah. If, you, if you go outside the develop, you know, if you, outside Europe, outside the U.S., there is not a lot of fill, finish infrastructure. It's really lacking mm -hmm. in, outside those two territories. So as a result, you know, there really is a, a business opportunity, you know, to fill that gap. Uh, and of course, the concern is that, you know, fill finish has to be very well executed, right? You need highly trained people, highly and, trained people, and, you know, mm -hmm. highly validated facilities. Uh, and because, you know, all you have to do is infect one vial and you're going to have a real patient, you know, safety issue. So. So it's it's really a very important um, gap in the in the offering uh, worldwide, and 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 certainly there is quite a business opportunity as a result. Yeah. I think one of the things you'll see, and, and probably in some of the exhibitors here at the show, is uh, those companies that develop uh, pharmaceutical filling lines um, are looking to uh, advance that with um, automation and the incorporation of. Uh, pre-assembled single-use disposable fluid paths. Uh, all of those things reduce the type of intervention that uh, has to occur. They reduce the clean room requirements and, uh, and limit the uh, ability of contaminants to enter the final product. And, and that will ultimately, I think, make it easier to do final formulation and filling um, in, in uh, the uh, developing world. Uh, as these drugs get, get uh, approved in fact, for that. In, in fact, tomorrow there's a, there's a panel session on advanced filling technologies using single use and also closed systems. Mm -hmm. That really are the two key components yeah. to putting these systems in, in, in regions where there is simply less infrastructure. Right. Uh, and and to, to ensure that those, are, those operations are, can, can be performed at a high quality and high consistency. Just so you know, and again, our discussion earlier today with uh, a couple of folks from uh, Mo Biologics Modular and, a and the guys mm -hmm. over from Walker, their point there was, you know, we're, you know th this podular, they call it, mm -hmm. or my, you know, the answer is you build yeah. in all of this stuff, fly yeah. it into the country, and then you train the yeah. folks. Yeah. Well, the key yeah. there is to less rely less on a clean environment and go to more closed systems that have been irradiated and, and can be operated closed. That's, that's right. the trick. If we continue to rely on class 100 atmospheres to, fi to fill vials that are open to that atmosphere, we, we continue to run the risk of, of you know, adulterating the drug. The key is to get to closed systems, single-use delivery systems and piping and tubing that can be all irradiated 
and then used in a closed fashion. Yeah. That will be the real breakthrough yeah. uh, in and, this space. And I, and I just want to add to that. I mean, we're, we're talking about that in the context of biosimilars and getting some of these very innovative biologicals out to the masses. But another significant driver for that is vaccines. So we have some major initiatives to get vaccines out to the developing world. They also need to be manufactured under the same type of fill finish systems. Uh, so both of those uh, are, are mm -hmm. pushing for that. I mean, ideally, uh, we don't want to have to be shipping uh, these uh, uh, labile molecules and labile vaccine formulations uh, all around the world. We want to be able to produce them locally and get them to the patients uh, in a much more stable and, and safe manner. So fill finish becomes a critical part, not just for biosimilars, but also vaccines. Yeah, yeah I remember we used to, I had worked with uh, Peter Kirkpatrick down at the University of North, North Carolina. And they had, if you, I don't know if you, he, they, they had put together a training facility to yes. teach young, yes. young fellas. Yeah. And my point to him was, you know, it's missing one piece. Uh, he said, Peter, I said, you know, you got to put it, training. you know, yeah. you don't sell it in a handy Danny cryovac, you yeah. know what I mean? It's got to be in a vial at some point. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, PDA is the co-sponsor here at Interfex, and uh, they've uh, really taken the lead in training people how to do uh, the final filling aspects of it. They have a, a training facility in Bethesda. Uh, that's, a, that's a key place that people go to learn how to do final aseptic filling, which is a, a different practice than the the biological api part that mm -hmm. that north carolina does yeah and they have a very good program in north carolina but you're right they, they go to the finished api and then i said the, the the next best place to go for for final filling training would be the pda institute yeah so it, it, i guess maybe it's just me i always it's, yeah i guess from my end of the business it's always fully integrated you yeah. know the synthetic oh, small molecule, yeah. Yeah, the, the yeah, synthetic yeah. processes on that end of the campus, yeah. we fill it on this end of the campus. Yeah. You know? Well, but it, there's a lot of small molecule generics that are also uh, well, yeah. APIs. As a matter of fact, much of the small molecule generics today are made in China and India. Absolutely. And, um, and then they're brought over here and they may go through a final purification or a right. final formulation. They're filled here, right. but the drug itself is, is synthesized in, in Asia for the most part. Hey, I have an interesting, maybe off the topic one, but I had a very, uh, an, an interesting discussion today about uh, track and trace, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, the point that you brought up about, you know, well, if you switch this to that and seem to me that this these these products lend themselves to track and trace i mean I, i'm not I'm just as a point of discussion i mean yeah. i realize it's out of the scope of what we're talking about no it's very much in the scope all right I mean, what so do you let's think say, let's say you achieved interchangeability to achieve interchangeability you have to convince the regulatory agency that you have such close similarity that they can be interchanged that the reference drug and the biosimilar drug can be interchanged at the level of the pharmacy so that pharmacist depending on whether how much he, he or she has on stock in stock and what the physician prefers can switch one for the other that's that's interchangeability so in that scenario if there's any adverse event that occurs in the patient that's dosed down the line any kind of immunological any kind of adverse event that's product associated or product related the difficulty be coming back okay well what did they get and which which one was it and how you know how long did it have to take effect so, so that's and so the pharmacovigilance downstream of interchangeability is really important. The biosimilar, the level of biosimilarity, biosimilarity is very important to achieve that that interchangeability, and and it's it's so important that it's it's called out as a distinction from biosimilarity. Interchange biosimilarity does not mean you're going to have interchangeability. Yeah. So. So it's a, it's a higher bar. I think the other part of the track and trace is really to to uh, get better control on um, uh, uh, counterfeits that come in, um, and also uh, theft mm -hmm. uh, of, of of drugs and repackaging of those drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and and in the same way that we're concerned about that with uh, uh, small molecules. Uh, we're starting to see that even with biologicals as gotcha. well. Yep. And, uh, and as more of the biosimilars become available in this country, uh, unfortunately, there's going to be some, uh, uh, some people that are, looking, that are gonna look to take advantage of, 
of maybe switching those around and, and still get the price of the originator drug and track and trace will will help us to maintain control on that. All right, we're gonna start to wrap it up, but I wanna I had a question for you. Obviously one of the things that always interests me is you know physical pharmacy, physical chemistry or medicinal chemistry and pharmaceutics. This was the background that we equipped the industrial pharmacists with. Mm -hmm. What are you guys looking for in the young people that you bring into your company? What kind of backgrounds? Biochemical engineering mm -hmm. uh, is probably the, the, uh, the strongest one. Uh, uh, manufacturing engineering. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, ma manufacturing engineering. I mean, it, it, traditionally in, in biotech manufacturing, you've had uh, uh, PhD biochemists, uh, but as we mature in our industry, we're really looking to bring in more basic chemical engineering and biochemical engineering and manufacturing experience to, to optimize these processes because it, it's no longer the race that it was 20, 25 years ago, which was to just get something on the market and how you made it and how much it cost to make it and how efficient your process was, was uh, often ignored. Uh, today that's become very important so um, those are the kind of people we look I for. I think the, the first thing you probably should do is in addition to that is build an analytical team that can analyze the quality attributes of the current mm -hmm. reference product. So that's really sort of step one. You want yeah, to understand right. the quality attributes of the current reference product and you want to understand how much variability there is in those quality attributes from lot to lot to lot of the reference product. So these are going to be protein you, biochemists and uh, exactly. analytical Exactly. Chemists. And that way yeah. you know your target. You know how wide the goal post is through which you need to, you know, you need to kick your football, right? Or your soccer ball. Uh, and so once you have those ranges for those critical quality attributes, then you need the team of process yeah. scientists yeah. and engineers yeah. and cell biologists yeah. and purification biochemists yeah. to create a process, develop a process right. that achieves a product with those quality attributes that fall within that range for so all, the, of those, all those attributes. Yeah, and then the cell culture specialists become very important yeah. because uh, how you formulate the culture media, the conditions in which the cell is growing uh, can have a major impact on not only the productivity uh, to produce your, your biosimilar, but, uh, but, but the chemical entity itself and how it's glycosylated um, and so you need specialists to be able to do that. So let me see if I got it straight now. So biosimilars aren't generics. They're not quite identical. They're not identical. not identical. They're not interchangeable. Track and not trace. Yet. <laughs> not yet anyway. And well we would not want them to be or not. I would what does well, it mean a goal? What's a goal? It's the, the goal? It is the holy grail for the biosimilar developer because yeah. they don't want any objections from the physician or the pharmacist in using their drug, yeah. right? Yeah. Got it. So yeah. assuming it's the same formulation, they don't want any, uh, any objections. Uh, you know what, I, I if, put if, it this if there way. Objections, yeah. If there are objections, they need to do other things. They need to have a stronger marketing team, so they have to put more effort into marketing the product better to convince the pharmacist and the physician to use their product over mm -hmm. the reference product if they, if, they, if they don't have interchangeability. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. why, they're, that's why they want to yeah. pursue that. There was a, a study I saw published, uh, came out on the news this morning, uh, that, that said that patients may not see the benefit of biosimilars because the insurance companies have established uh, copays uh, that are still quite significantly high, right? Um, but are still much less than the total cost of the drug. So a biosimilar will save money uh, at the insurance company, but it won't reduce the amount you pay within your copay of insurance. For government agencies, biosimilars are going to save the, the taxpayer dollars that are spent to supply those drugs. So those are the, the bodies that are most eager to see uh, biosimilars available and within each state that it's declared as interchangeable uh, so that they can just switch out all of the patients and reduce the cost. That, that, that's the major drivers, and those are the people that are interested in it. Uh, individual patients, I don't know that individual patients have a, a desire to switch to biosimilars, especially if 
it's not going to change their um, out-of-pocket expenses in order to get them. Highly unlikely. Yeah. You know, I just... So, Paris, Jerry, I appreciate the interaction today. Uh, it was a, an enjoyable time. And uh, thanks, everybody, for stopping in and um, on this session on Biosimilars for Interfex Live. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.